know what to expect from a movie tie-in game, a low-poly likeness of a Hollywood star, and for the game to be terrible. Turn yourself in, Rambo! Why? Because so many games based on movies are nothing more than cynical cash grabs, of course. Rushed together with the sole aim of tricking unsuspecting movie fans into thinking, hey, I liked David Fincher's Fight Club, I bet it would be fun to play a game based on that. Next thing you know, you spent 60 bucks on a terrible beat-em-up and have unlocked Fred Durst as a playable character for some reason? But once in a blue moon, along comes something very special. A movie tie-in game that not only doesn't suck, it actually manages to be even more enjoyable and important than its silver screen source material. Join us then in marvelling at these alarmingly good games based on films. But where some spoilers for the games and the movies they're based on. Welcome to Tatooine, Padres fans. We have perfect weather today for the Bunta Classic. And a big turnout here from all corners of the Outer Rim Territories. I see the contestants are making their way out onto the starting grid. You probably don't need us to remind you that Star Wars prequel movie Episode One: The Phantom Menace, is often regarded as, well, not good. <laughs> Confusing political plots, dodgy CGI, and meme-inspiringly wonky dialogue conspired to give Episode One the lowest critic rating of any Star Wars film on Metacritic. And while the film has its defenders, including James, who will be editing this video, and whom I'm trusting to not replace my criticism with an adoring Qui-Gon Jinn mont- And that's why, in conclusion, Episode One was terrible. Sorry to rant for so long, but the point needed to be made. Yet from the ashes of this reviled prequel rose something truly beautiful, a lightning-fast racing sim based on the best bit of the film, the bit where baby Anakin did a sci-fi death race across Tatooine and nobody mentioned trade embargoes for a whole 15 minutes. Star Wars Episode One Racer, developed by LucasArts and released the same summer as the film, was a real pleasure to play thanks to its speedy yet weirdly light and floaty anti-grav pod racing. The game had some fun mechanics too, I mean in addition to the pit droids that repaired your pod between races. You could boost your craft at any time for a burst of speed, but doing so risked overheating your twin engines, which would then need repairing, slowing you overall if you weren't careful. Although not being careful in this game carried much bigger risks to be honest. Midichlorians didn't help you much there, did they, Annie? Someone get a sponge, maybe we can save the midichlorians. The game earned itself a Guinness World Record for being the best-selling sci-fi racing game, beating out the likes of Wipeout and F-Zero, and regularly places near the top of lists of the best Star Wars games. In other words, LucasArts ended up making a game much more fondly remembered than the movie it's based on, and even editor James can agree with that. I mean, seriously, the Padme plotline, it doesn't even make sense. You have learned to use your gift well, Riddick. And yet there is such a dark soul lurking behind those magnificent bright eyes. These? These are a courtesy of a slam preacher. Think Vin Diesel in space, and there's only one epic sci-fi multifilm franchise that springs to mind. No, not not that one. I mean, well, yes, but no. But it's forgivable if you forgot about the Riddick films, which included 2004 sequel The Chronicles of Riddick, a wildly ambitious space opera that unfortunately didn't go over at all well with critics and flopped at the box office. Which must have been annoying for Starbreeze Studio, who just spent bloody ages making one of the best games the original Xbox ever got to serve as a tie-in prequel. Oh yeah, I forgot you don't like this part. Statistically, landings are the most dangerous. <laughs> you got nothing left to live for, Riddick. I do. I shut up, would you? You're already counting it, aren't you? I said shut up. Your funeral. 
Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay tasks you, Riddick, with breaking out of a maximum security space prison with all the tense stealth and brutal takedowns that implies. It was super fun to play, graphically impressive even before the remaster that came out five years later, and all flavoured with the growly internal monologue of Vin Diesel purring into your headphones like a sleepy lion plotting how it would break out of a safari park. I should hide the body. Someone might notice. The game wasn't that long, but it was still about three times as long as the movie on which it was based, and certainly three times as entertaining, as you crept around grimy prison environments before dispatching your enemies in outlandish ways and delivering pithy one-liners. It ain't the fall that gets you. Here it is. He's gonna say it. I am Groot. When you think of Frank Herbert's sci-fi epic Dune, it's impossible not to imagine harsh, otherworldly deserts, bitter political feuding, building-sized sandworms, and Sting wearing those pants. Wow, we made it nine seconds into a segment about Dune before mentioning Sting's pants. A new record. But what can we say? They stick in the mind, as does all of David Lynch and Universal's critically panned film adaptation of Dune. Because, like Sting's codpiece, that movie is confusing to look at, was expensive to make, and nobody wanted to see it. He who controls the space controls the universe! Remarkable, then, that one of cinema's most notorious flops led to one of the most important games ever made. Construction complete. Dune 2, developed by Westwood Studio and licensed from Universal by publisher Virgin Media, was released a whole eight years after the movie, using only the bare bones of the Dune plot to set the scene for a game in which you fight for control of the valuable Spice Melange. Dune 2 was a great game, but more importantly was a very early example of what we now call real-time strategy. Its gameplay loop of harvesting resources to build more units became standard, as well as other ideas like playing as different factions. In other words, Dune 2 marked the point where real-time strategy became what it still is today, and Westwood Studio went on to make the Command & Conquer series. In case you haven't heard of Command & Conquer, here's a bit of gameplay from that series chosen at random. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! You know what they say, who controls the space controls the universe. <laughs> Ballistic X vs. Sever was an early noughties spy thriller that pitched lethal spies Antonio Banderas and Lucy Liu against each other in a deadly game of cat and mouse. Let's finish this. The movie is notable for one thing, having the lowest ever review score on critic aggregator Rotten Tomatoes, with an absolute zero rating across 118 reviews. Two things if you count the name looking less like the title of a movie and more like an anagram puzzle. Airsick Bless Velvets? Basilisk's Clever Vest? Both of these sound like better movies, to be honest. The tie-in game, X vs Sever, however, was notable for much more praiseworthy reasons, as it's a rad first-person shooter. Heaped with praise upon its release, this sprite-based blast-em-up let you play as either spy, X or Sever, with an interconnecting plot and levels tweaked based on who you chose to play as. The 3D shooting, meanwhile, was smooth and entertaining, an achievement in itself, bearing in mind this game was built for the Game Boy Advance, which had barely any processing power and barely any buttons. The fact that this game turned out so well is even more remarkable when you find out how it got made. Crawfish Interactive bagged the X vs Sever license based on a speculative script for the film and actually released it before the film it's based on had even entered production. which sounds extremely efficient, until you factor in how much the movie's plot got changed along the way, meaning that, for instance, Crawfish had to go back and redraw a bunch of the game when the movie makers decided the character of Sever should be a woman. The game's good fun and a real technical marvel, which are just two of the reasons you're better off playing X vs Sever on Game Boy Advance than you are seeing the film it's based on. 
Also, there are way more explosive barrels. Come on, Hollywood, we need more explosive barrels. Don't get us wrong, Goldeneye is a pretty alright movie. Sean Bean is there for one thing, and dies twice, which is impressive even for him. But Goldeneye 007 for the N64 is a brilliant game. So brilliant, in fact, that you probably already know of its many fine qualities, because YouTube channels like ours never stop banging on about how influential it is. Perhaps the smartest thing GoldenEye 007 did was not feel the need to adhere too closely to the plot or vibe of the movie, and it certainly does stray from the film thematically, unless we were out getting popcorn during the scene where Bond slaps a room full of scientists to death. It also only just came out in time, although development on GoldenEye for the N64 started months before the movie came out in 1995, it wouldn't be released until 1997, just before the next Bond film, Tomorrow Never Dies, came out. A close call, although in a worst case scenario they could have just changed the name on the box, and insisted the Sean Bean character was actually Jonathan Price's Elliot Carver from Tomorrow Never Dies. I mean, I don't think you could legally call this a likeness of anyone. You're probably wondering how anything could improve on the original movie King Kong, in which a giant ape trashes Manhattan. And you're right, that is a hard thing to improve upon. But maybe if it was in colour? And the ape looked like an actual ape? And also, Jack Black was there? That's the bold cinematic vision of Hobbit botherer Peter Jackson, who remade King Kong in 2005. And the film isn't bad at all. For one thing, there's a bit where King Kong pulls a T-Rex's mouth off which gets you an automatic 60% minimum score on Metacritic. That can only go upwards from there. But imagine if you were pulling a T-Rex's mouth off. Well, friend, that's the dream that the King Kong tie-in video game makes a reality. The game switches between first-person sections in which you play as puny humans, which I mean, fine, but then really excels when it puts you in control of Kong himself, who just absolutely cannot with all the dinosaurs on Skull Island. Playing as a giant ape and going ham on prehistoric lizards was about as fun as it gets. I mean, apart from the bits where you get to go ham on Manhattan instead. The only downside is that, like the film it's based on and the 1933 original, the story of this giant ape cruelly stolen from its habitat must of course end in tragedy, a disturbing tale of man's hubris that leaves one of nature's greatest miracles dead in the New York streets. It wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. Except no it doesn't! In just another way that the game is better than the film, if you earn enough points during your playthrough you can unlock an alternative ending to the story, where Kong climbs down the Empire State Building and goes back to live on Skull Island, body slamming dinosaurs happily ever after. Like we say, better. How to make a follow-up film to James Cameron's Aliens. How to follow the powerful final scenes, in which Ripley faces down a house-sized xenomorph to save the life of Newt, a lost little girl. Probably don't start your movie by saying the little girl died off-screen, we'd say. But in Alien 3, Newt's dying is just the first cinematic disappointment, in a movie that never captures the thrills of the first two films. Luckily for gamers in the early 90s, Blockbuster also did video game rental, because Alien 3 the video game kicks ass. Whereas the movie saw a beleaguered Ripley fighting to get the convicts of the Fiorina 161 prison colony organised into an anti-xenomorph team, the game doesn't bother with any of that. Instead, it throws you directly into the space boots of a shaved-headed Ripley, who has only a flamethrower for company and zero tolerance for xenomorphs that are not on fire. 
Meanwhile, in a nice touch borrowed from the films, a motion tracker in the corner gives you a clue as to where alien enemies are. Spoiler alert, where they are is everywhere. You could hardly call the game deep, unless you count how deeply barbecued Ripley leaves every alien in her path, but it was damn satisfying to play, with atmospheric pixely artwork and a wicked soundtrack ideally suited to stomping aliens. Alien 3 came out on just about every games machine at the time and won glowing reviews across the board, making it altogether a much better entertainment product than the film it was based on. Newt still dies though, so I don't know, 4 out of 10? So those were just some of the video game movie tie-ins that were, to our utter amazement, better than the film? What? That's not supposed to happen! Did, did no one get the me- did they not get the memo? Did they- did they seriously- there's like a rule. They, that's like a universal rule and not in, as in the film company. That's just a, a, like in the universe. Um, anyway, okay, can you think of any others that have breached the protocols <laughs> and actually made decent games that are better than the films? Uh, please do let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up and maybe subscribe if you haven't already because we do way more videos like this. Uh, we also do fun Let's Plays and we do at the moment lots of regular streams where we just sit and chat about video games, play video games, all sorts. Uh, we think you might enjoy it if you liked this because it's more of us. Hi! Uh, <laughs> thanks for watching. Uh, look after yourselves and we will see you next time. Bye!